understand why that nice Mr. Shepard persists in using that ridiculous, silly music at the beginning of his program, child. It goes on and on and on, and I'm going to write him a letter for his own good one day and tell him how he can improve his program. Right, Charles? Charles, I'm talking to you. Charles, are you listening to me? I'm just a thing along with a phrase. La, 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 la. $50,000 mystery sound for tonight. And we have a clue here for you. That is not the sound of a man sipping out of a paper cup of lukewarm coffee. There's a clue there. Uh, I must admit, though, that I have some terrible... Uh, let's, let's, let's make this confession night. Do you mind? Uh, I say this as a disclaimer because many people get very embarrassed about confessions. I mean, genuine confessions. I mean, you know, the phony type of confession is when you stand up and you say, I am a sinner. That's a phony confession. It's when you begin to tell him what kind of a sinner you are, that he gets rotten. I mean, you know, there's sinners and there's sinners. There's uh, guys that write things on the walls of subways. Now, they may not be sinners. They may just be frustrated writers. <laughs> they may be guys looking for an outlet, you know. The publisher. In fact, I know one guy who worked his way up. He used to write stuff on those Levy rye bread signs. You know the ones? Shows the guy eating the rye bread. Says you don't have to be Jewish to like Levy's rye bread. Well, he went around writing stuff. By the way, that reminds me. Um, I heard a terrible thing, and uh, this is by way of a confession tonight, since it is the uh, middle of the week, you know, and uh, it's a long way till the weekend, which means that hope is not yet budding eternal in the human breast. I must confess something. Uh, I heard today what they call the lower level of the George Washington Bridge. And I was shocked. Absolutely shocked. And I was riding along in this nice car with this nice lady. You know, there's a certain type of lady that you can only call a nice lady. You know, she's got a flowered print dress with flowers all over her head, you know, the hat. And you, can, you know, she's born wearing a girdle, you know, that kind. I'm riding along and I paying, you know, just making casual comments like it's, uh, the sky's up there. Yes, it's true. It's, uh, it's a nice day. Indeed. And we're driving along the West River Drive there, and we all of a sudden there's the bridge going over, and I said, uh, <laughs> the bridge. It's kind of pretty, isn't it? Yes. It was a pregnant pause. I should have known better anyway. Just do you happen to know what they call that lower level of the George Washington Bridge? I said, why, no. They call it the lower level of the George Washington Bridge? She said, no, actually. And then she told me what they called it. And after she told me, she went, hee, 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 hee. And there was a pregnant pause again in the car. I mean, such a thing to be told. And uh, then I asked her, I said to her, uh, Oh, lady, uh, what's the difference between a Polish watermelon and a watermelon watermelon? She says, well, I haven't heard that one. And I told her. Well, we went all the way to the 57th Street exit on the West Side Highway telling rotten stories to one another. And this was somebody's mother. Her crying out loud. Give me a little of razzmatazz in there. Her crying out loud. And tonight, WOR here, which is this very serious radio station finally decides to, uh, as part of its vast public service programming, finally decides to salute all mother types. You know, this was somebody's mother, this lady, telling me this awful stuff. We've decided to salute all mothers out there 
who from time to time have evil thoughts. I mean, you are hardly ever talked about, lady. <laughs> hardly anyone ever wants to admit you do. And, uh, you know, you know what I mean, girls, I guess. And uh, so tonight, we salute all of you out there. And uh, may you dream on. You know, the worst kind of, uh, it's been said by many people. I think it was Dante who said it. It was later paraphrased by Earl Wilson, that well-known writer. That the most evil type of debauch is a debauch that occurs in the mind. Let you think that one over again. And you see what I'm saying. I mean, have you ever been, uh, well, you know. But the, it's, like, it's like the contemplation of Saturday is like usually 50,000 times more effective than Saturday turns out to be. You know, Saturday turns out to be they tow your car away, you know, somebody writes a four-letter word on your trunk, and, you know, and you can't get a parking place, and people yell and holler, and somebody spills a ketchup on your knee, and, uh, you know, and you get the scrambled egg on your tie, and the whole scene, and the chick keeps looking at you with two cold steel marbles that she uses for eyes, and, uh, it's much better to dream of fantastic Saturdays, you know. So, tonight... We salute all of you. Well, that reminds me. Hold it there. Hold it there. For those of you who've been wondering about this problem, huh? well, listen to that equipment, isn't it? I have. Oh, oh, speaking of confessions, I want to confess something. Now we all know that showbiz people—they uh, live high off the hog. There's no question about it. They. Uh, well, you, you, you watch a Johnny Carson show, and you know Josh Gabor comes on with those dresses with the little sparklies all over it all the time. This is pretty high living. I mean, people don't ordinarily stand around the kitchen wearing a tight dress with sparklies all over it, you know? And uh, Carson wears one of those skinny comic suits, you know, the TV comic suit, the kind that shines. You know, the kind that shines. It looks like it's made out of Reynolds wrap. And uh, that's the kind that Jackie Carter wears, ultimately. That's a TV comic suit. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, and they live high off the hog. And they sit there and they talk about their friends. They say, uh, well, I was talking to Onassis just the other day. And, uh... He told me that he was buying the Thunderbird, he was buying Ohio, and that we're all going out on a yacht, you know, we're going to the Mediterranean, and we're going to call Princess Grace. They live very high off the hog, see. Well, I'm, you know, I'm in showbiz, so I'm supposed to have these, uh, these very, uh, uh, very serious tastes, you know. I, I'm supposed to want to go to places and uh, eat Epicurean, Epicurean food, Epicurean, Epicurean, I like that word, Epicurean food. Uh, gee, you know, I've, I've never, I've never visited Epicuria. Uh, is that near Liechtenstein? Uh, it's one of those, one of those little banana, or is it one of those banana republics, huh? Epicurissimo. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm eating this Epicurean thing. I'm supposed to like this, but I have a real, I must admit something terrible, a secret admission. Well, I, I don't know how to get to this. Uh, I have a fantastic weakness. And I'm going to admit what it is. I have a weakness for a chock full of nuts. Yeah. Shrimp salad sandwiches. Now, you don't want to admit that. And whenever a chock full of nuts has the shrimp salad sandwiches, I stock up on them. See, and I stick them in my pockets. And then when I'm invited to go to one of these fancy French restaurants over on the east side, and they put the sizzling thing down in front of me with the little almonds all over and the little birds and and the uh, little eggs and stuff all of them. I secretly eat chock full of nuts. Little sandwiches there. Now, now I, you shouldn't admit these things. I, I wonder what whether or not Jaja Gabor secretly likes peanut butter and sits at night in her fancy apartment and scoffs peanut butter, skippy peanut butter, for example. I happen to know that, uh, that our president, Lyndon Johnson, you know, he's got a tremendous uh, weakness for hot dogs, I mean, real hot dogs, you know, the kind of hot dogs. Did you, you know, did you get at the Yankee Stadium. You know, the kind with the plastic meat inside. And <laughs> he's got a terrible weakness. Well, now, these weaknesses, you see, are, are uh, the kind of thing that people just don't speak about in, in public. You know, you don't want to admit that you like piccalilli, uh, the real food. This is soul food of, you know, walking around people. Uh, chock full of nuts, brownies. I wonder how many people... Uh, eat chocolate nuts brownies during any given day. I wonder how many gallons of Needix orange drink are scuffed by guys who 
keep saying to you, themselves, you, you, you should really like uh, Bloody Mary's made at uh, La Palme de la Frite. And uh, actually, <laughs> actually, what you like is needing some orange drink. Well, now, this is a, this is a problem that the people have uh, had to deal with all the time. It's the, what we call the superimposed culture upon the real culture, which you ordinarily have. And uh, science stands ready, of course, to deal with most of these things for us, uh, to uh, help us become better and greater human beings. For example, we have a note here. Would you give me a little romantic music uh, for those of you who are interested in the advance of science? A psychological study, and this is from Boston, and that's a very official town. They don't mess around in Boston. A psychological study of married women has found that women who enjoy food the most also dig sex. I just thought you ought to know that. No, it's not me saying this. It's a, it's a Harvard. It's a researcher, and that's very official. In fact, uh, this was submitted by a pair of psychologists who conducted experiments in this department. I don't know exactly how they conducted those experiments, but <laughs> you got the kind of mighty... I've got this terrible mind. You keep seeing experiments being conducted that they always talk about on TV and so on, but uh, I don't know how they did this one, but it must have been nice. I mean, you know, they've got the music in the laboratory. Bring it up there. And this large fat lady is sitting there at this table. And they put a dish of uh, uh, spaghetti uh, with clam sauce, a little butter there, just a little oregano on the top, see, and a little Parmesan cheese, and a big carafe of uh, sparkling uh, ice cold Italian vino, and uh, some uh, a bread garlicchio, huh? a little butter there. And uh, they stood there with their clipboards and says, Well, okay, go, baby. And she starts to lay it in. I can't bring it up. That's the beginning of the experiment. No, oh, that's nice. Very nice. That's a very nice experiment. Yes, sir. <laughs> you know, that's that's the kind of no, that's the kind of strange. You know, I'm delighted that the science is finally getting to that point where it's it's conducting experiments in that kind of thing. You know the the, the uh, old wives' tale. Now, do you know that's always been an old wives' tale? In fact, I'll never forget the first person I ever heard tell that, you know, that that was true, was an old wife. And, uh, oh, I'm just, <laughs> everybody looks at me. <laughs> now, look, if Johnny Carson said it, you'd scream, you know, because uh, the band would play a couple of razzmatazz notes. Uh, speaking of bad jokes, this is WOR in New York. Hit the button now, please. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee. Speaking of exercise, uh, tomorrow night, uh, I'm, oh, no, no, I better not uh, discuss this. Uh, what do you mean I'm not? I, 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 you didn't know what I was going to talk about. <laughs> I'm telling you. But uh, I, I, uh, I was thinking about that old wife. You know, that's an old story. Uh, people have always thought that, that... Uh, the person who likes to eat food uh, also likes a lot of other things in life. This is where the myth of the jolly fat man came about. Did you know that? That there is an old, there's an old story, an old, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a canard. And uh, it's been around for a long time. And now science is beginning to investigate these things. Well, kids have got millions of them. All well, kids have got millions of things that they, they believe completely. Now, I don't. I, I, I suspect they change from area to area in the country, you know, depending on what you got in your area, you have ideas. Now, for example, one of the uh, common canards that, uh, well, I still believe it today. I mean, no, <clears throat> I haven't changed a bit. If you put an indelible pencil in your mouth, you, you, you know what happens when you put an indelible pencil in your mouth, Al? And you know that purple, uh, that purple uh, uh, color that comes off? That's a deadly poison. That you can absolutely go into the other world by sucking on an indelible pencil long enough. You've never heard that? Well, have you ever heard what happens, Al, if you chew gum and you swallow the gum? Forget it. Plugged up. I mean, that's the end of you. Your stomach sticks together, that's what. And if your stomach sticks together, how are you going to eat red cabbage? And you live on red cabbage or whatever it is, meatloaf. 
And uh, that was a terrible fear. I, I remember running along one day, and, and I was coming into second base, and I had a wad of bubble gum in the trap, you know, and I come running into second base, and I'm rounding second base. I trip, down I go on my face, boom, down goes the bubble gum, and I lay quivering in the dust. I didn't care whether I was tagged out or not, you know. I knew I was... A <laughs> I mean, it was all over. It doesn't matter anymore, you know, the ball game. And uh, for, for days after that, I was worried. Really, you don't tell your mother these things either. You don't go, Ma, I'm going to die. I swallowed two wads of Fleer's bubble gum. It's gone. What am I doing? Of course, you see, because the idea about swallowing the bubble gum had come from my mother. It was passed from mother to mother. Don't swallow your gum. Forget it. Uh, there was another, <laughs> there was another kid, uh, belief, a very, very, very strong belief, that inside of every golf ball, there is a small, inside, there's a little, uh, inner core that's inside of it, and it's filled with this fantastically explosive, poisonous liquid, that if you ever take the cover off a golf ball, and you start running all this little, you know, this long rubber band stuff, you unreel it, and if you get right down to the bottom, boom! Either that, or if you throw it in a fire, It'll just devastate the whole neighborhood. These, <laughs> these are completely, uh, oh, they, they, the kids believe them completely. And, and I would like to know whether science has done anything in investigating what happens when you suck on a, on a, uh, on a pencil like that, you know? Uh, they don't know. You, you're, you're all sitting out there laughing, but ha, uh, has science, uh, really seriously investigated whether or not a guy has had it if he swallows, uh, two big wads of Flair's bubble gum? Has anybody tried it lately? Well, no, you see. Oh, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of those things. I remember, I remember I'd stand in there, I'm, I'm brushing my teeth, saying I'd open up the medicine cabinet. And there would be the bottle of iodine. And on the bottle of iodine would be the skull and crossbones. It would say, absolute instant poison. And I never could figure out why they didn't put that on other things. Like, uh, pencils. Uh, you know? Now, there was another thing that all kids believed, and I will have to tell you a, a thing that happened one time. Uh, this is a, uh, by way of a disclaimer, I'm going to point out this is a very uh, provocative story. It could cause repercussions that go beyond the studio walls here. But a myth, it wasn't a myth. Now, I'm not going to say it was a myth. I'm sorry. A rumor began to spread. It began to spread when I was about in seventh grade, maybe eighth, and it spread from kid to kid. It was whispered in the, in the schoolyard. It would be spoken of in hushed tones back of the garage while the wind blew through the poplar trees. That kids hiding under the porch would uh, discuss it. Kids in the basement that were supposed to be making a model airplane would discuss it. It was a, it was a rumor. But it was a rumor that was always founded on supposed fact. For example, a kid would say, uh, did you hear that if you don't blah, 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 that uh, blah, 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 blah happens? Did you hear that? And the other kid would say, he, if you hadn't heard, no, are you kidding? No, really? And the first kid, yeah, Doppler's brother did it. Yeah. And boy, what a wild thing. Doppler's brother. Because that made it official. And uh, it was passed around from kid to kid. Now, I don't know whether it even got out here to the East Coast. I have a suspicion that it possibly even started in the East Coast, knowing what I know about the East Coast now. But I can tell you this, it was a well-founded rumor that had been uh, tried and tested by many workers in the field. Now, I never personally knew any, but they were certainly always quoted. What was that rumor? Well, the rumor concerned a popular soft drink that is sold in every drugstore, in every A&P, everywhere. And it has two names. Each one starts with a C. And it's got a bottle, you know, that's shaped like a, you know, a little bit like Mae West, or if you stand at a certain angle, the bottle looks a little bit like uh, Jane Mansfield against the sunset. Okay. The rumor was that if you took two aspirin tablets and you put them in a bottle of this stuff, boy, it's Zonksville. You are bombed out of your skull. Just like today, there's a rumor passing among kids, you know, 
that if you smoke a banana peeling, <laughs> you know, you're dead. <laughs> and they always refer to somebody else. Whenever I've talked to anybody about the banana thing, he says, why? Well, oh, of course, it's a fact. I know a kid. Now, listen, I know a guy who uh, knows a guy and his brother. And it, uh, it goes on and on, you know. And I, I'm sure that within the next couple of months, uh, the great banana hoax will be exposed. Uh, maybe, maybe this is an idea by the banana company of the world. Has it occurred to you that maybe the banana people are, are, are a little bit worried by, you know, everybody's on a diet these days and bananas are high in calories. You know, that people stay away from bananas when they're on diets. And uh, they do, you know, that's a fact. They stay away from bananas. Where do you find out what happens when you boil potatoes three times at, uh, and then uh, <laughs> take these skins, chop them up, and mix them with chewing tobacco? And then hold it against your... Uh, your back molars for 20 minutes, suck deep, and close your eyes. Wait till the big banana hip gets going. Oh, and, you know, they, I, I suspect that uh, maybe there's something to this. However, I remember a little incident that occurred back of the garage that was back of the high school where we went to school. Now, you know, there are some kids who never, who never investigate their school. These are the kids that become drum majors. These are the kids, you know, the official kids. They always come in the front door of the school. And they're always seen in places like gymnasiums. Uh, they're very official kids. Now, there's another kind of kid who goes out the back door of the school. And when the school is about to start in the morning, he doesn't stand in front of school where all the other kids stand. He and about 19 other guys with leather jackets and that stand around in the back where the driveway is, where the trucks come into the back. Well, I got into that crowd for a while. And every day, we would stand back where they would uh, take the garbage out of the school, for example. You know, the big high schools have a big garbage disposal problem. And uh, you never think about this in connection with the school, but they do, you know. And, and out would come these great big baskets full of garbage. Fantastic. We'd all stand there and watch me and Schwartz and Flick and Brunner. All the other kids are working out for the debating team. They're running for the president of the senior class. Me and Schwartz and Flick and Brunner are looking at the garbage that's coming out of the back of the school. Look at all this great stuff, you know, that's thrown on there. There'd be broken test tubes, and there'd be stuff from the labs, and old tennis shoes from the gyms, and all. And we're standing there watching this stuff. And they had a Coke machine in the garage there for the workers. The workers are all hanging around there, see? And uh, these were the guys, not, not the beloved. You know, there's two types of workers, too, in schools. There's the beloved worker. He's the beloved old caretaker, old Jake. Uh, you know, he's usually, he looks a little like Casey Stinkle. And he has seen generation come and generation go of high school kids, thousands of them. And then, uh, then there are a few other, usually a few other people who hang around the outside of the schools and people love them, like the guy that cleans up the lawn and clips the hedges. But the, but the underground workers are the guys that drive the gray trucks in and out the back of the school. They have big signs on support of education. Uh, they're the guys who come on Saturday and fix the roof. Uh, they're the guys that are way down to the bottom of the of the school building, uh, working on the furnaces and stuff like that. And so we got to know all these guys. You know, there's all kinds of guys standing around back there with caps and that. They they run the school. And me and Schwartz and Flick and Bruner one day are back in the garage. It's lunchtime. And uh, we got our lunch. You know, we carried our lunch in a bag. And I'm eating my salami sandwich. I was going through my salami, period. I remember I went through a period where... For only, for about two years, the only thing I would eat was salami sandwiches in school. Big fat salami sandwiches. I would not eat anything else. I'd yell and every night I'd go to, I'd have to go down to the store and get my salami for the next day. And I liked the soft salami, not the hard salami. You know, the, the hard Italian. This was the soft, kosher type salami. And even to this day, you know, I have a fantastic weakness for this kind of soft, kosher salami. As a matter of fact, uh, at one time, one of the great gourmet dishes that I once enjoyed was salami ice cream. And, uh, well, it's very good. No, I mean, uh, what, what, uh, what so I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I've seen it and I've had it. It was, it's excellent. Now, don't laugh. And I used to have these salami sandwiches every day with jam on them. Now, that sounds terrible. Now, wait a minute. You have not tried it. I'm sorry. I, I would put strawberry preserves. Uh, my mother, I mean, she'd make it. Uh, I'll admit this. Every morning when my mother would make my lunch, she would turn her head away. Uh, it was early in the morning, you know, and she, she hadn't had her coffee yet. But, uh, 
uh, to me, you know, this is a great thing. So she'd make it a big white bread, see, she'd lay this salami down there and then put the, the butter on it and then she would put uh, a thin layer of strawberry jam and I'd sit there, oh boy, I could hardly wait for lunch. And then she would put two big Twinkies in there. I, you know, I was on my Twinkie kick at that period. And every day I would go out in the back with Schwartz and Flick and Bruner. And we would eat. Uh, Schwartz was going through his bean sandwich phase. Now, <laughs> have you ever had a bean sandwich? Schwartz always had bean sandwiches. Well, that, that's a very simple sandwich. You make that out of uh, baked beans, you know, the kind like uh, Heinz's baked beans or Ann Page baked beans, something like that. And, and they would give him this baked bean sandwich, big thick sandwich with baked beans on it with ketchup on top of it and with sliced dill pickles on top of that. And does Schwartz would eat a baked bean sandwich. He'd stand, he'd gulp down, you know, his teeth would go. And I can remember those baked beans just squirting out for a foot and a half on either side of Schwartz when he got, you know, the sandwich would squash. You'd have to give him large clearance on either side. Now Flick, on the other hand, and I kind of hesitate to tell you what, Flick went through a terrible period. Uh, Flick went through his lard sandwich period. Now, now wait a minute. Listen carefully to me. This is done. All right. You laugh. Flick ate lard sandwiches every day. Now, here's what a lard sandwich is. You, this is a, a rye bread, dark rye bread sandwich, see? And he used to cut this lard. I, of course, now I'm not, I'm not advocating it. This is what Flick had. He'd put lard on the sandwiches, you know, thin, not thick, but you know, like you put butter. It would be lard, see? And on the lard would be a slice of Bermuda onion with salt and pepper and butter. That was a lard sandwich. Flick like that. I was, I, I, I'm not advocating. It's an awful scene. Now, Bruner, on the other hand, Bruner went through his banana sandwich period. Now, do you know what is it, a banana sandwich? If I told you the kind of banana sandwich he ate, you wouldn't believe it. He took sliced bananas, put them on white bread, and uh, on top of the bananas, they would put ketchup. Now, that sounds fantastic, but he loved this. Now, I'm telling you, yeah, see, Al knows about that one. All right, well, all right, all right. He was very, he was a very early hippie, this kid. All right, now, if I, if I told you, uh, just six months ago, that some kid sit down in the basement and, and, and uh, dry banana peels and smoke them in pipes, you'd laugh. Why? They were doing it. Well, Schwartz and I were like, Bruno, we're standing back eating our lunch, and we got to know all these guys. You know, they're all standing around. Hey, oh, Charlie, how are you? you know, and these are the worker types. You know, they got the, the baseball cap on their feet hanging out of the truck door because they're eating lunch, too. You see, they'd be sitting there, and they'd have their thermos jug, and Schwartz and Flick and Bruno and I, we'd like to hang around with these guys. And one day, this one guy named Mike, I just remember, very big, big Mike, Mike is sitting in the front seat of the Chevy pickup truck, a panel truck, looking out of the window, and he's got this bottle of this soft drink, which I'm discussing here, see, and uh, he's got this bottle like that, and he takes a big, long gulp of this drink, and he goes, <sighs> oh boy, <sighs> wow, and then he turns to his friend, Stan, who was his helper, says, here, you want some, Stan? Stan says, no, no, I got to drive. Flick says, what do you mean you got to drive? Aren't you drinking a blah, 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 Ola? So hard. Oh, this is the regular one, man. <laughs> oh, wow. I'm half bagged already. Whew. This stuff works like dynamite. Is it ever quick? And Schwartz says, what? What do you mean quick? Well, we'd heard this rumor, see, before. But now we were seeing it in action. And the four of us standing right back of us is a Coke machine. You got the scene? Well, Mike says, I'll tell you, kids. Boy, this is a fantastic jag. Whoa. And he, you know, he plays like he's drunk. And, oh, wow. Uh, uh. <laughs> and Flick says, really? Does it, does it do that? He says, you, boy, you know it. Hick. Hick. You remember when everybody thought when a drunk, in the comics, whenever a drunk was drunk, they showed him going hick? <laughs> I've never seen a drunk go hick. <laughs> Any more than I've ever seen a baseball fan holler, kill the umpire! Never heard it in all the years I've been going to ball games. Nor does anybody ever go hick. But here's this guy, he's going, hick! Ah, oh, boy, wow. Well, do I have to tell you that within 13 milliseconds, Schwartz and Flick and Brunner and me 
are crowded around the Coke machine. And that we are feeding it nickels. And out come four big ones. Big bottles. And Mike, sitting there in the truck, looked at the four of us. He said, look, you guys. I don't want you to go around telling you I taught you nothing, you guys. Oh, no, no, huh? Hey, uh, guys, I want you to know, boy, this is real pop. Come on, Stan, have a little drink, Stan. Tess says, no, I'm driving. I can't. I'm sorry, Mike. I'm driving this afternoon. Well, then Mike said, all right, you guys, don't blame me, but the, if you want to get the aspirins, they're up there in the cabinet. Well, the four of us go up to the cabinet, and there it was, a little box of aspirin, a little bottle, the little 20, the little 100 tablet bottle, you know, the familiar bottle with the little yellow label, the little white cross on the outside says aspirin, five grain. Well, I open up this bottle, and all four of us stand in a huddle around the cabinet, shaking the aspirins out. Hey, okay, Schwartz. Hey, Schwartz. Only take two of them. Okay. And here up in the truck, you can see Big Mike is lolling around, his feet are falling, you know, shoes are falling off. Fantastic effect he's had. The four of us stood. And one after the other. It takes a terrible, you know, the terrible amount of guts to try something like that. Uh, after you've heard so much about this, I think, I think this is what keeps a lot of people away from sin. Is that the, uh, most people lack the guts to actually do it when they're confronted with the opportunity to do it. <laughs> and so, you know, we sort of stand back. And so each one of us put the, we put the aspirins in there. And Big Mike is watching. See, Mike says, I put you, well, here, guys, mix it up. You ain't gonna get nothing unless you mix it up. You put your thumb over the top and shake it up. Oh, wow. Hick. Oh, wow. And so, <laughs> he's a terrible actor. So the four of us take the coke. Well, you know what happens when a coke, you know, you, you, you go like that, see. And boo, and it goes all over the seating, all over. He says, oh boy, you see how powerful it is? Oh wow. Uh, you know, this is all, all grist to the mill. It seems to be very, you know, very real. It's very powerful. And the stuff is flying all over. And so the first guy to, to sip on it was Flick. Flick was, Flick was always the first in our crowd because he was bigger. He was taller. And he's dumber than all the rest of us. He, <laughs> so he was always the first one. And <laughs> so Flick takes a little sip of his. Oh boy. Holy smokes. Wowie. Hick. <laughs> Hick. Well, Bruner immediately takes a big swig of his. Bruner was a born follower. Schwartz takes a belt of his. I take a belt of mine. And the four of us, you know, because we're, we're involved in obviously something that's totally clandestine. This is uh, lunchtime in school, you know, obviously. So the four of us have been belting away at these things. And each one of us is beginning to believe that he is totally bombed out. You know, this is the, <laughs> this is the sneaky quality of it. You can, you can convince yourself of anything. I, I, I just wonder how many people today are smoking all kinds of different things, and because they're totally convinced that they're, that they're, you know, they're bombed, they really are. You know, they convince themselves, and by George, they are. It's a, auto-suggestion is a tremendous power, just enormous power. Hardly anybody ever really yet knows how powerful it is. And so, the four of us is, you know, drinking this stuff, and, and, and then all of a sudden, Flick says, oh, wow, hey, holy smokes, hey, Schwartz, well, oh, hick. And he starts walking around, you know, and you know how kids always, when they're, when they're playing drunk, they stagger, you know, stagger around real big, and, and Schwartz is staggering around, and Bruner, of course, he's the littlest one, he gets in the act, and now all four of us, I can remember the feeling that it, you actually feel it, you know, it's, 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 uh, you're so convinced that you actually feel it. everything that's in, so, so, you know, naturally, when you take a big swallow of this, any kind of a soft drink that's carbonated, what happens? Yeah, up it comes, you know. So we'd go, hick. <laughs> well, what we'd seen enough, you know, drunks in the comic strips, another when you went hick, you were drunk. Well, the four of us are staggering around like this in the back there. And we're yelling and hollering, and Big Mike is yelling and hollering at us to cut it out. Stan is yelling and hollering, and they drive the truck out, they clear out. You know, they started this thing, but then they left, see. So they clear out, and there was the four of us down in the basement of the school, totally convinced that we were drunk, all four of us. 
Well, now, that afternoon, after lunch, I had algebra, which I remember vividly because every day I used to hate to go back to school because I hated it so much. Uh, the teacher, the whole scene. I didn't like this class at all. And, and every day I would, I would feel this, this terrible premonition about ten minutes before the end of lunch. Uh, the premonition of approaching disaster. This, this creeping boredom. This, uh, creeping miserableness. Well, I'm, I'm down in the basement there of the school with, uh, my little bottle clutched in my hands. It's about three quarters gone. And I'm, I'm huddled. I remember huddled next to a bunch of lockers that the workmen used, and feeling as though I'm completely drunk. I'm, 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 I'm just, oh, the world is swirling around. I'm saying, oh, wow, oh, wow. Hey, ho, sweet Adeline. You know, it's just the thing that kids always believe, too, that drunks always sing sweet Adeline. Uh, how many times have you seen in the comic strips drunks singing? I've never seen them do this, but we did, you know. Sweet Adeline, my sweet Adeline. And... Suddenly, that is 12.55. That means end of lunch hour. The bell rings down in the basement. It rings in the garage. It rings out on the football field. It rings in the gym. It rings in the classes on the second floor. And you can hear thousands of kids running. Thousands of kids running up. Well, Schwartz and Fleck and Brun and I staggered out of the garage. And would you believe it, by the one of those... Fantastic, unbelievable coincidences. We ran right smack into Mr. Settlemeyer. Settlemeyer was my algebra one teacher. An old stinky Settlemeyer. C.M. Settlemeyer, he wore his hair plastered flat. You ever had the kind of teacher that wore his hair real flat? And he, he combed it across. You know how Hitler combed his hair across? Real flat. And he had glasses with white silver rims. That kind of guy. He looked a little like, if you can imagine... Uh, Robert Taft, the late Senator Robert Taft, if Robert Taft had been unsuccessful, <laughs> this is the way, you know, his collars were a little frayed and he wore black suits, and very, uh, a, kind of a very straight square type guy. And Settlemeyer sees the four of us come reading out of the garage yelling, sweet Adeline, just the four of us. And, and he says, what are you doing? Have you been drinking? Four of us stood there, each one of us with a bottle of Coke in our hand. Have you been drinking? And you hear thousands of kids going into school, you know, running up the halls. I mean, can you imagine anything more of a scandal than four kids from Algebra 1 caught drinking at lunch hour? I mean, you know, that's a real scandal. I mean, it got caught bag, and Flick is sort of hiding behind Bruner, and it was hard because he was a foot and a half taller. And Bruner is hiding behind a fire plug, and, uh, and, and Schwartz is lying flat on the ground trying to pretend he's a snail, and I am standing there with my Coke bottle. And then, finally, Settlemeyer says, Settlemeyer says, have you been, have you, did you, do you believe that silly thing about putting, about putting aspirins in that drink? That's silly. And suddenly it was. All four of us are stone cold sober. <laughs> stone cold sober. He said, now you get in there. And I want to hear any more of this stuff. Now get in there now. And I joined the throng going in up to the second floor. I got my books under my arm. My lunch box. And I felt like a fantastic idiot. And Settlemeyer was behind me. Schwartz was ahead of me whimpering. Flick was ahead of me, still carrying half of his bottle, and he wasn't going to throw the coke away, you know. And uh, <laughs> Bruner's ahead of him, and all of us go upstairs. It wasn't until years later comes the prologue. Years later. We are about now, I'd say, just before we were about to go in the Army, all four of us. We are now out of high school. And one night... I'm walking down Kennedy Avenue, and I see Flick. And you know how those things happen. Within five minutes, four of us, me, Schwartz, Flick, and Bruner, are sitting around the round table in the Bluebird Tavern. And Flick has a double finger of scotch in front of him. I have a single finger of bourbon. Bruner has, I believe, I believe it was... Uh, 
I believe it was a an old fashioned. I don't recall what the other guy had. And the four of us are sitting there. Flick takes the scotch and he says, You know, I heard a silly rumor once that if you drank four of these and held your nose, it would do strange things to you. And I said to Flick, That's a silly rumor, Flick. You remember that crazy rumor about the Aspens? He <laughs> said, Yeah. Settle my, I remember him. And so we sat for a long moment. Flick says, I think I'm going to try it, though. So down with the first one. Down with the second one. Down with the third one. Down with the fourth one. Flick is now holding his nose. He's beginning to slide under the table, too. Went in the front door. I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Yes, Virginia, there was a Mr. Settlemeyer. And yes, Virginia, he did look at the crowd and say, still at it. And Flick, from under the table, looked out at Mr. Settlemeyer and said, this one works. And Mr. Settlemeyer says, yes, it certainly does. And he walked up to the bar and tried it himself. 